Elizabeth had turned the key in the fox lock, releasing a heavy metal bar that scraped across the inside of the front door with an impressive prison gate sound, and was about to attack the seagull lock when the phone in the apartment started to ring. By the time she had opened the second lock and was sliding the key into the last one, this was New York after all, the phone was on its fourth ring. At almost midnight, it had to be the West Coast calling. She could still grab it in time, but Elizabeth didn't hurry. Slow, with purpose, slow, giving the internal anger and hurt time to shoot from zero to a hundred. It needed only seconds, like the startup speed of a Maserati, except it was never at zero. Not anymore. Hadn't been for the last eight months. And she couldn't imagine a time when it would ever be there again. As always, the hurt overpowered the anger, and what welled up in her throat came with tears that choked her. You going to get that? David Stevenson, the young man standing next to her, asked as he stretched his arm over her head to hold the door open. David was 6'3", and at her 5'6", it was way over her head. That's okay she managed, quickly ducking her face away from him, stealing a sliver of extra time as she put the doggy-bagged pork chop she was carrying carefully and more precisely than necessary down on the hall table. It gave her enough time to catch her breath and let the tears slide back down her throat. And with that momentary respite came an irresistible, nasty need to satisfy the anger physically. All she had was her purse. It would do. She flung it as hard as she could into the hall chair and watched as the Prada knockoff hit the upholstered back, bounced off, and came to rest on the edge of the chair. A little dumb, but it was a surprisingly good release. Like that embarrassing time a month ago on Broadway, when the fury escaped her mind into her mouth and she said out loud, really loudly, I hate you. People turned, shocked and then interested. She quickly put her hand to her ear as if she were on a cell phone, and it became ordinary and they lost interest. David had already walked into the living room, missing all the action behind him. You have a landline? And an answering machine? My mother. A going away gift. She said it made her feel that I was safer. How, I don't know. I think it made her feel safer. Elizabeth could hear her own calm message playing in the background. Please leave your name and number, and I'll return your call as soon as possible. Thank you. I'm just going to throw this in the fridge, she said, scooping up the doggy bag, back in control. Would you like a glass of wine? By now, she was halfway through the narrow, sparsely furnished living room, heading into the safety of the very small jerry-built kitchen with its squeezed-in mini refrigerator, two-burner stove, tiny oven, and an outsized, badly chipped, probably pre-war like the rest of the building, porcelain sink deep enough to wash babies as well as dishes. Sure, okay. With a couple of ice cubes, please. Lizzie, pick up. The woman's voice on the machine was plaintive. Please, I really need to talk to you. Of course, Elizabeth could hear it from the kitchen. Could she ever miss that voice? Now so sweet, so seductive, pleading softly, spreading out the vowels almost song-like. Lizzie... That voice, so heavy with love. Love me, it said. Forgive me so I can put you out of the way and get back to my own life. I forgot to fill the ice tray, but the wine's really cold. Elizabeth's voice was so calm, David thought maybe she hadn't heard the message. It sounds important. Don't you want to get it? Now Elizabeth was back in the room, carrying two glasses of chilled white wine. David was sitting on the small, low couch, so low his knees almost obscured his face. She answered him completely composed, as if she were reciting dialogue in a play. Actually, no. It had everything but the English accent. David's cheeks creased in a slightly embarrassed smile that pulled in his breath with a little hiss. He was politely uncomfortable, knowing he had stumbled into something too personal. Sorry. That's okay, forget it. She brushed it off, but there was no way to hide her flushed face. I have to tell you, it's really weird, he said. Because I didn't take the call? No, because the voice, it sounded just like you. No wonder. How many times over the years had she herself been fooled by a recording? For just a flash, she would think, was that me? 
or worse, when she had to pick herself out of a family picture. How pathetic is it not to recognize yourself? Elizabeth handed David his wine without comment, put hers down on the low table next to her least favorite chair, comfortable but covered in a scratchy plaid fabric. Normally, she never sat there, but the choice was either next to David on the love seat, which would surely be more intimate than she felt right now, or the scratchy chair. She wasn't in the scratchy chair two seconds before she bobbed up and reached for the stereo, which, because the room was so small, was within arm's distance. You like Beyonce? Really, he said. I mean, you could have fooled me. It was identical. He wasn't going to let it go so easily. Instead of the scratchy chair, Elizabeth sat back down next to David on the love seat, making the only move that could detour the direction of the conversation, a direction she seriously didn't want. Certainly not with this semi-stranger, a guy she'd barely spoken to before tonight. Her boss. It worked. He turned to her, delighted, a little surprised at the possible gift he was not expecting, all thoughts of the telephone message wiped out of his head. They worked together at the online magazine Show Survey, off-Broadway in New York, a weekly struggling along with only a smattering of sponsors and even fewer paid advertisements. It was put out by a passionate staff of three dedicated theater lovers and the newcomer, Elizabeth Wakefield. The printed copy left at hotels was not much better than a throwaway, but Elizabeth was grateful to be part of the venture. Not having much experience in theater, she'd lucked into the job eight months ago after two frantic days in New York, one of which, the worst, was her 27th birthday. She celebrated alone, then lied to her parents that she'd spent the day with a couple of old friends from Sweet Valley who had moved to New York. Her mother asked who they were, but when Elizabeth sidestepped the question, she very kindly and wisely didn't pursue it. In fact, her parents had been very gentle and understanding, never asking the wrong questions. Even the two times they came to see her in New York, they only talked about her work. Actually, it was David who had hired her. He and his partner, Don Barron, both in their early 30s, both trained accountants who hated the confinement of numbers. Both theater enthusiasts had self-financed show survey about two years ago as a kind of Zagat ratings guide for Off-Broadway. No critics, just audiences. Elizabeth was hired to interview people coming out of the theater and write up paragraph descriptions of shows, just as Zagat did for restaurants. There wasn't enough staff money for Elizabeth to see all the shows, so they had arranged to buy tickets the day of the show at the TKTS booth on 47th Street, and only the cheapest ones at that, and only for shows without an intermission. If there was an intermission, Elizabeth would sneak in free for the second act. Though she worried in the beginning, she never once got caught. She had a story ready about how her brother was in the cast and had told her just to use his name. Of course, she always found an ensemble name in advance for her, brother. So far, she hadn't had to use it. All printed copies of show survey were free, given away at hotels and restaurants, but it was beginning to catch on, and they had picked up a few more online sponsors. Recently, they had added interviews with everyone involved in the theater, actors, writers, producers, directors, even ushers. Just this week, David had given Elizabeth her first interview assignment, a playwright named Will Connolly. Tonight wasn't a real date with David. It was more like, Hey, you eat yet? No? How about we grab a bite at McMullen's? Hence the leftover pork chop. It was okay, but somehow Elizabeth had gotten stuck with the tip. David was attractive enough, tall with a very good body. Each muscle worked well out at least five times a week at a local gym. But the tip thing was a turnoff. Additionally, sleeping with the boss was a famously bad idea. In her four years at the Sweet Valley News, Elizabeth had never done it. Well, of course, Todd was in her life then. Still, David did have a great body, and maybe the tip thing was accidental. Right from the start, Elizabeth could tell he was attracted to her. It had probably helped in the hiring, though she had decent credentials, but a little gratitude wouldn't hurt. He was, after all, a nice guy. A nice guy she didn't feel like sleeping with.